All right, so now today we're going to tie the briny muddler. Um, here's one sitting right in front of you right now to check out. This is a style of saltwater fly that has derived or that I played with and kind of came up with, um, but it's totally based on the work of uh, Bill Catherwood, um, it's, who loves short shank hooks and a deer hair head to push water to attract flies. He made a whole series of flies called the Giant Killer, I should say to attract big fish. He made a series of flies called the Giant Killers, and that man had more knowledge of saltwater bait fish and, and predators in his head than pretty much anybody I think I've ever met in my life. Um, just a brilliant old salty guy who knew so much, um, had a dominant influence on me even from far away. I only met the man about a half a dozen times. The idea here is to create a dominant head impression and, and I have some really good pictures of bait fish that will show you this of a dominant head impression or a dominant head area where a fish could strike and then a ghostly impression. Now this guy here, this is tied with a bunch of polar bear sitting out the back. Um, it's a great fly. It works really well. I'm going to tie for you, however, one that's just a little bit different. I'm going to tie one that's in one of the best saltwater combinations in the world. Olive, pink, and white. Work. This briny muddler, it's a dynamite pattern along rocky beaches like you're liable to find at Montauk Point. On the bottom on a sinking line worked up. And it's caught me some of the biggest fish I've ever caught on a fly in my life. As we start to tie this fly, one of the things I'm going to do is tie it with some bright orange thread, or at least the under base. Uh, it's only a 3 aught thread, uh, pardon me, a 6 aught thread, and you might want to tie this with 3 aught because A, this hook, which is a Gamagatsu finesse hook, this hook is incredibly sharp, and you just tack it, and you are absolutely going to... Oh, man, start that again. Okay, scratch it, start again, three, two, one, go. Okay, this hook is a finesse hook. It's a wide gap, short bodied hook. It's a great hook. And just like I spoke to you about before, I'm going to tie up to the barb of the hook. I don't want to go past the barb of the hook. And you'll notice as I turn, I'm very careful to avoid the point of this hook. This is a super, super, super sharp hook. So. Right above the barb is where the shank tends to turn on most hooks, and it does on this one as well. So if I stop the thread, even with the barb, all of the bend of this hook shank stays wide open. And I'm not going to have anything here. This is going to stay bare. So that's really good biting power for the hook in the fish's jaw. And these are saltwater fish, so they need to be um, worked big time. I pre-cut a little clump of bucktail. Uh, I didn't bother evening the ends or anything. I generally don't like to do that with bait fish. I want it to um, be more tapered in its appearance. And you pre-cut everything, of course. And now, I start cranking it down. Remember, I think I mentioned before, hold your materials with your hand right on the top of the vise. And in so doing, you will make sure that this uh, does not get wrapped around the shank. If you apply too much torque, and we're going to talk a lot about torque in this video, if you apply too much torque, watch what happens here. If I apply force as I come around the shank, do you see how it grabs and pulls that bucktail? See how it grabs and pulls? I don't want to put pressure on that way. Now watch. I'm going to come, I'm going to do a loose loop right there to keep it funneled. Now I moved forward a little bit, and I'm going to pull straight down. And in pulling straight down, I don't twist this over the shank at all. So we're going to work a lot in the tying of this fly on torque pulling it straight down. Pull down, wrap around, pull down, wrap around, pull down, wrap around, pull down. Just like that, all the way up the shank. And I'm using this uh, fire orange thread so that you should be able to get a really good view of it. Now, the biggest thing about putting a layer of bucktail down is that this layer of bucktail gives me a wider version of or um, a wider width to the shank to work on if for any reason you are experiencing a little trouble with this fly and i'll do it right now um, just to make life a little bit easier on some of you guys who are playing with deer hair for the first time um, what i'm going to do is make the shank even wider 
by putting a little bit of bucktail on either side of the shank. Now this is not a necessary step, but if, if you have experience with deer hair, don't bother doing this. If you don't have experience with it, then by increasing the diameter of the hook shank, it's going to make it a little easier to work with materials a little later on. Okay. Uh, specifically when I lay feathers down so that they have something to bite and also when I uh, stack my deer hair. We're not going to spin deer hair, we're going to stack it. Okay. And again, remember, no pressure in a circular fashion. You can also, by the way, you don't have to pull vertically. Like if you're afraid of catching a hook point, you can pull perfectly horizontally. That's fine too. Okay. All right. So this is the only part of the fly that I'm going to tie from the eye back to the barb. Everything else will be tied from here back to the barb. Okay. So this point back is where every other piece of material is going to be tied. Now, the first thing I want to do is put a little bit of flash in this fly, and flash is a funny thing. Um, I think a lot of people believe that the effect of flash is to make it noticed, which it is. But I don't think it's noticed for the same exact reason that people think it's the fish notice it. First off, I don't like to use a lot of flash. I like to use some flash. I like to spread it out a little bit. And um, I have a lot of pictures of bait fish. I, I used to take tons and tons and tons of bait fish pictures. And what I started to realize as I was taking bait fish pictures was that any bait fish that was swimming perfectly natural, that is to say with its dorsal side up, its ventral side down, its two lateral sides swimming normal, they pretty much disappear in the water. They have natural camouflage built in, kind of like um, the tiles on a stealth bomber in that it absorbs sunlight as those tiles absorb uh, radio waves for the radar. But with when they swim and turn to the side, now those scales are not in proper position and they start reflecting a lot of light. If you've ever seen a bait ball in the water, they turn suddenly and an explosion of light comes off the water. So what is the point behind putting in flash? Well, I think Flash not only says, hey, here I am, but the only bait fish that really emit Flash are bait fish who aren't swimming normally. What, what are bait fish that are not swimming normally? Bait fish that are not swimming, swimming normally tend to be the injured ones. They tend to be the ones that bigger fish can go after right away. See what I mean about having a, one fish turned on its side and not swimming right? Look at the Flash in the upper right. Look at here. Ghostly impression in the dominant head area on a shrimp, on a peanut bunker. Look at the pearly pink fluorescence coming off of that peanut bunker. Again, the silver side, dominant head area. The rest of the bait, a ghostly impression. This has really helped my son and I. This is my son when he was a little kid. Catch nice fish. All right, so we have the idea, the understanding now that flash actually in its own way suggests movement to fish and singles it out as a target. What I've done so far is I've laid the bucktail in to create a wider base. Take a look at how wide the base is here compared to just the width of the hook shank, which I can put there and you can see where the bend of the hook is. There's a significant difference. I've probably close to doubled it. Now, um, at this point in time, what I want to capture is I want to capture motion. Um, I like my flies to have lots and lots of inherent motion. I don't think I am a particularly gifted manipulator of flies, so I like to let the fly do the work. So I like very soft materials, and Whiting makes some products. It, um, it's called Chickaboo with soft tackle, but it's not like the ones that are trout size with um, speckled backs and uh, hen hackle type appearance. These fibers are much more like marabou, and while I still have some marabou in my house, I have a lot more of these fibers than I have marabou. Now, I'm going to lay this directly on top of the bucktail. In fact, I'm going to put a little bit more out there, and then I'm going to strip this back. And I want to make sure that it stays even over the hook shank, and there's a couple of things I can do to make sure that happens. The, the first thing I already did was make the base wider. See how that just lays perfectly flat? 
Second thing is I'm not cranking down on this yet. I go work my way backwards. Then as I come forward, I start to put pressure on it to really lock it in there. You'll notice I'm not even touching it with my right hand. And this feather is staying exactly where I want it to stay. All because when I worked it back in here, I put no torque on it whatsoever. I just let it lay flat and my only pressure was to pull straight down. Now I don't want this feather coming out, so I'm going to leave that stem there. And when I'm done putting all of my feathers on, I'm going to fold the stems back to really lock them in. I don't want to fold it now because it'll create a base problem with the next set of feathers that come up. Speaking of which, the next feather I'm going to put on there is a nice little bit of pink. Um, Pink to me indicates a little bit of the pearlescence, a little bit of flash that are in bait fish. When Bill Catherwood was making his incredible patterns, he didn't really have mylar and other forms of flash. So what Bill would do is he would build into it a lot of your pastel colors like lavender and pink and so on to create that impression of a flushed bait, um, a little bit of color in bait, a little bit of I wouldn't exactly call it the same kind of flash that we have, but a little bit like that. Okay, so now this can get a little bit um, sketchy, if you will, because you do have a stem now underneath this. And working it back, I'm going to lay this directly on top. And sometimes what it helps to do here is to crush the stem. And you can use a pair of pliers to do this. I'm just going to use my teeth. And that flattens the stem, which makes it just a little bit easier to work with. And again, softly on the way back there. Don't lock it in yet. You can see that pink feather is laying almost perfectly flat. There we go. Now I'm very happy with it. Again, these turns around the base here are not tight at all. They're very soft. I am not cranking down on this. Now I'm going to start cranking down. Okay. By the way, you'll notice when I do my turns, I try to stay inside of the barb of the hook. That really helps not catching the thread. It is a pain to catch the thread with this particular hook and or fly. Now, I want the fly to be a little bit longer, so I'm going to put another pink feather on top, but this pink feather is going to be just a little longer than the previous pink feather. And I'm only going to put two pink feathers on this fly, so that should work about right. Again, I strip it back. Again, I'm going to crush it with my teeth. Um, these are Whiting American Hackle Necks. So you can see here, Whiting American Hackle Neck. And as such, the stems do tend to be stiffer than, say, a dry fly neck. Okay, laying that right there on top. Soft wraps around again, a little loose wraps. You can see this bump I'm making right here. This bump is very important. It's going to serve to flare the deer hair, which I want. I like to take the feathers like this a little bit, and that loosens them up. You can see they're laying perfectly flat there on top, which is what I want. Now, um, the next thing I'm going to do, the fly is going to be made up of mostly a more flat olive and insect green olive. But I like to put a little bit of a brighter olive in there too. And this is a whiting spay hackle, but within that spay hackle, I'm going to add a little bulk to the center of the fly and a little green stretching down the base. This is again honoring the style of Billy Catherwood in the sense that I'm getting motion, I'm getting the illusion of bulk put in here, and I'm getting a little bit of a brighter green. This is not quite chartreuse. But it is enough brightness that it's going to stand out from the olive, which is going to follow in just a minute. Again, the teeth. I just realized I must have a little chip in my right tooth because <laughs> the right one is not working quite as well. i got to put it between my left two front teeth. All right, so I lay this on top. Again, notice I, I keep this nice and short. I have no pressure on here whatsoever. Now I'm putting pressure on now pressure now straight I'm not really torquing it I'm not pulling it around my pressure is going straight down okay so 
notice the words I used before. I said the words illusion or illusion of bulk. This is, this is not bulk. It looks like it's got a little bulk, and when wet and wiggling around, it'll be both translucent and at the same time look like there's more mass there than <clears throat> there actually is. Okay, another piece of Whiting American Hackle, and this time I'm going to put a couple of these grizzly barred olive feathers up across the top of this particular fly. So here's candidate number one. I want this to be even longer than any of the feathers so far because generally speaking the dorsal t color stretches all the way down into the tail so this is good. You'll notice I pre-measured it there to get an idea of where it's at. If I had tied more of these recently I might be able to do it off the top of my head but it has been quite a while since I tied one of these. I think I might have mentioned before at least eight months probably more like uh, ten months to a year. Probably not since um, Somerset last year, which is uh, almost a year ago. Okay. My thread slipped there just a little bit. Okay. All right. I'll lay that right down on top. Here's, notice these loose loops. I, I don't know if you can hear this or not. There's a slight hum from um, one of the lights I have running right now. Uh, that moving side to side that I just did is a great trick to get this, the feathers to flatten out when you have difficulties with them. Um, now I'm putting pressure on to pull it straight down. This very back, I try to form a little bit of a funnel by not putting pressure on the thread. Um, and by doing that, it keeps the materials inside of a cone, if you will. All right, uh, next one up, we'll do another one of these feathers right about the same length, a micro bit longer possibly. There we go, laying it right on top. Once It takes a little while. I, I actually think in some ways the hardest part of this fly is what I'm doing right now, getting these feathers to lay perfectly flat. It's not a simple deal. And as I just did with my teeth, crushing these stems and again, you can use a uh, plier. Just don't use serrated teeth on the plier. You can uh, also flatten them that way if the thought of putting the feather in your mouth disgusts you. See, this one's going on with an attitude. Being an eighth grader, not doing what it's supposed to. So, I put them on again. There we go. Much nicer. Why fight with them? Nope, see? rolling it up. I had a little torque on that one and it was messing me up there violated my own rules okay nice and simple cone going back now I'll pull down now I'll pull down and she's staying good and steady for me much better much nicer okay now I want a bump here. This bump is very important. As you will see in a little bit, it flares the deer hair. So now, I'm going to actually go back, bend the stems backwards, and wrap over it. Okay. Sometimes it helps to just wet your fingers a little. And in so doing, you can uh, work these feathers a little bit, get them to lay in position so they're not such a nuisance. You can see a bit of the wet and shape of the fly right there and how it has a natural taper to it. Okay. Now, that's not quite enough. I need something to fill these areas in right here. And on that same white chickaboo feather, so to speak, there's a patch up at the end here, which is filled with classic marabou type of feathers. And I'm going to take one for each side. I'll do my side first. I like to make it definitely less than half as long as the other, but closer to a third is better. 40% to a third. Okay.
there we go and then on the other side here if possible have it concave out a little bit kick it out to the side and give it a little bit more breathing certainly won't give it any less this one I just accidentally stripped the fibers off of not that it matters that much but again I want motion I want the illusion of bulk without there actually being bulk it's very important because you can fish this fly on a sinking line and if you have too much bulk it doesn't want to sink just like before fold back this both serves to lock the feather in and to increase the size of that bump and the bump is a good thing okay this a little bit get it all to come back and the only other thing I like to do at this point we're pretty much done with the uh, tail end of the fly here the only other thing I like to do is put just another piece of flash in again I'm not nuts about too much flash so I'm actually going to take two pieces of flash and and I use glimmer but you can use whatever flash you prefer um, just to make it a little easier for you I'm going to turn this upside down loop it around, split the barb of the hook, you know, the point of the hook, and I'm going to take the time. Flash is evenly distributed. It's not locked into a single line of flash. Even the stripe on the silver sides is not, like, it doesn't work the way you think. It pretty much disappears under water. In some conditions, it actually just looks dark. So by spreading them out, I'm distributing the flash across the bait fish, which has a better chance of catching light. There we go. And there we go. All right. And the last thing I'm going to do with this, is I'm going to whip finish off right in front. One, two, three, four. Beautiful. I like to kick that up a little. Remember what before I said? Look at you have that whole shank of the hook in which to grasp the jaws of a nice big fish. And um, I've caught more big stripers on this fly than on any other fly. The last thing I'm going to do is just put a little shot of crazy glue here, a little super glue, just to kind of lock everything in there. I love a fly that doesn't fall apart. Now that said, one big bluefish and this fly is done. Okay. All right. Now, these two uh, olive hackles are being a bit of a pain in the butt here, but we'll work that out as time goes on. I'll just take this one here, and there we go. Lay her right in. She'll get wet, and she'll lay right down. Okay, now, the next part that we have to do is the deer hair part. And a lot of people think that deer hair work has to be tortured. And I don't believe that deer hair work does need to be tortured. Deer hair work um, requires a mastery of torque and this thread, which is Goodbrod GX2. Um, it's also put out by... Unithread uh, under a product called Unicord, and I think it's Dynacord out of some company in Germany. It's poly spun gel, something or other. It's really good. I, from what I understand, some tuna fishermen use it as backing on, on their reels. It's so powerful. Um, this is great stuff. The only thing you need to know about it is if you look here, you can see that mine is very flat. It's not spun, and you can tell that because I let go of the bobbin and it doesn't spin. If yours spins, it will cut through the deer hair. So don't let it spin. Make it stay flat exactly the way it is. So the first thing I'm going to do is uh, tie in the what I would call the foundation clumps. And 
the foundation clump needs to be set so that it is in no way, shape, or form spinning. Otherwise, you're going to have the head of your fly spin, and uh, that's just, I don't like it very much. So, poor deer hair work. I got to be pretty good with deer hair by putting a mirror on this side of the fly and watching how everything I did affected the far side of the fly so that it would come out looking pretty straight. Okay, so my under fur remover there. Trim before you put it on the shank. Not your final trim job, but enough of a trim job that it makes your life easy. You're going to canter the thread to the hook shank. You're going to take two turns over the thread. And now, you're going to pull straight down and then twist and lift all at the same time. And if you notice, that rotated the deer body hair, not deer bucktail, deer body hair, to the bottom of the shank, where on a bait fish you're likely to see more of a whitish bottom. Now, this is not locked in there. The way I'm going to lock this in, I want to use this bump to my advantage, and I'm going to jam everything, everything into that bump. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to figure eight it along that bump, weaving, always weaving, because if you don't weave, you're going to trap the deer body fibers down and putting it exactly where it is, weaving it right in there. Okay, now the next thing I'm going to do is take some olive deer hair, and in the course of getting this olive deer hair together, I'm going to lay a clump of it on the top. Again, removing the under fur from underneath. I'm sorry I keep it down a little bit, but this is where my waste basket is, and I'm in the habit of not making so much waste when possible. All right, I lay this right on top. I'm not going to rotate this around, so I'm going to do two turns. Watch your hook point here, and then pull straight down. Okay? Now, here's a few tricks that you need to know. Rather than pull vertically... I'm going to start pulling horizontally. And I'm also going to use my fingers to mash the fibers so that they stay perfectly flat. And what I'm looking for is a distinct color band between the olive and the white. If I use torque here, if I was to lift my thread and use torque, I can easily pull the olive into the white, which would be a good thing if I want stripes, but I don't want stripes. I want white belly, olive back. Okay. Now, I'm just going to put several clumps of deer hair onto this, and that's why we call it stacking, um, in an attempt to thicken it up. Again, I weave it through. Now this poly spun gel stuff is so good. Look at how I use my fingers here to keep it level. Okay. It's so good, look at this, I can take the pressure completely off the thread, yet the deer hair fibers don't move. They're completely locked in place. Weave, try not to catch any white in there, weave it all the way through, and now I purposely went with a darker clump of olive, and now I'm going to go with a little bit of a lighter clump of olive, and I'm going to lay it right on top. Now, when I lay this on top to get serious color bands, I like to take my scissors and create a valley. In creating that valley, I then put the deer hair right where it was, again weaving it through, smashing and mashing, keeping the thread flat, it's spinning a little bit, but really not much. Keep that thread flat. Do not let it twist. If it twists, it's going to cut into the deer hair fibers. Weave, weave, weave. Just going to take a look at the far side here. Yep, I got a nice color difference there. Nicely done. Pull tight. And I'm going to go with uh, a nice, I'm going to try to get a pretty thick clump of olive here, a little bit darker. See how it goes. I'm getting rid of some of the under fur there. Again, 
laying it on top, smashing it down this time with the scissors. Weave. It looks like I caught a piece of the flash on my side. Weave and weave there. So let's see how that goes. Okay, good. Now I'm going to turn it over and I'm going to repeat the same exact procedure with the white. Um, now, as I do this, I can lay it on fairly thick. And remember, because I'm in front of that bump, I'm leaving that whole back of the hook shank bare. So I don't have to worry about any hook gaps and making this uh, material such that I'm cutting down the hook's ability to hold the fish. Nothing could be further from the truth. Again, scissors, create a valley, lay this on top, weave it through, weave it, smash with your fingers, smash and mash time. Pull straight towards you. I don't care if that torque is in the vertical plane or the horizontal plane. In fact, it could even be in the diagonal plane. The big words I just used, or the big word I just used to a minute ago, was straight. So, torque is circular in force. I want no circular pressure. I want um, linear pressure. Linear pressure is not going to bleed one color into another. Circular pressure will. Okay, lay it right down on top there, put it in place, weave, 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 see how we're looking there, see I pulled it in a little bit, when you pull it in a little bit, take your scissors and very gently just work the points in there and when you do that you will remove the bulk of the white and the eye is going to go there anyway so if there's a couple of fibers there it's not a big deal. Pull straight towards you, weave around, and we're just about done here. The only thing I need to do at this point, I just cleared a little room by doing that, is I'd like to put a gill in. To put a gill in, we're going to use a little bit of red, and a little is the key phrase here. You don't want a lot of the red. And if you notice, when I trimmed that off, I kept it nice and wide. I didn't make it a single clump. And I want to lay it in as wide as I possibly can. Weave, weave, weave. It's not as wide as I'm going to want it. So I'm going to spread it with, I open up my scissor point a little bit. I reach in and I just grab a few fibers, being very careful not to cut the thread. Come to my side, pull a little bit wider yet. This side could be a hair wider. There we go. A little bit more push with the thumbs. Let me make sure I didn't pull much white in there. I did not. And pull tight. I don't know if you tie rotary or not, but I once asked Eric Peterson, who's an amazing fly tire. I asked him once what he thought of rotary vices, and in, that, in this particular case, I think it was the uh, Renzetti Masters, and he said it's the only tool that he ever used that instantly made him a better fly tire. I feel the same way about rotary vices in general. Um, I've used the Dyna King Barracuda. I think it's a very good vice. I think the Renzetti Masters is a good vice, though not as good as the Dyna King Barracuda if you're going to do heavy-duty work. Um, but... This J vice is, I think, the best of them all for this because it's fine yet it's tight. All right, so here's what I've done. All the deer hair I'm going to put on the shank is on the shank. Uh, is on the shank. I'm not going to wrap anymore, or spin anymore up to the eye of the hook. I've just pulled it tight, and you can tell. Look, I can take the pressure completely off the thread. All I need to do now is smash up and get these fibers up away, and then what I'm going to do is weave, make sure I didn't screw this up because that's a step I could screw up there, okay. I'm going to weave through the colors, making sure not to trap any of the fibers. I don't want to be in the red here, I want to be in front of the red. Good. Now I'm using straight vertical force. Again, weaving through, 
straight vertical force. Here it is. Good. Straight vertical force. Once I get it woven through the fibers. There we go. And now I'm right up against the eye of the hook. So I can just pull this back. Work it through. And... two, three, four. Voila! You have a stacked head on a very flexible butt of the fly. Okay, now we get to the trimming part of the pattern. Notice the bullet shaped head we want you to get on these briny mudlers. I shot the last series of films with a 100 and or all the previous sections of this with a 180 millimeter lens and then I took out the fly and I started trimming it right about here where I figured you could see it beautifully and unfortunately you could not it was just out of the frame so I just switched to a 50 millimeter lens and that is what I'm going to work on for trimming it so I'll rotate my vise out of the way and now I can work on how to trim this with you and what I'm going to do is is four cuts to make this into a bullet shaped head the first cut will go down at an angle like this the second will go this way, the third this way, and the fourth this way. But one thing about trimming deer hair, you want to go from the front of the fly toward the back. Now, it's very difficult for me to try to take a razor blade and do it this way. I haven't mastered that yet. So what I'm going to do is turn it around, and I'm going to show you the angle, approximate angle, at which I'm going to do this. And I'm just going to create one cut going up just like so. So I think you should be able to see that really well. Now I'm going to make a matching cut on the bottom. It's a little bit weird not having the feathers to hold on to here. So here you have one cut at an up angle, one cut at a down angle heading from the hook eye to the collar. I want you to notice too how important it is that the two sides of the fly have a distinct horizontal line where the olive meets the white. Next, I'm going to do a cut on the side, a lateral cut if you will. Now you can see that the head is coming in three of the four directions. And there's my last one right there. So I have all four directions done. As I look at it through the head, it looks pretty symmetric on both sides. If it's not quite, I can clean that up in just a minute. Now what I'm going to do is take the four edges, upper right, lower right, upper left, lower left, and I'm going to trim each of those. Basically what I'm doing is rounding them. See how I rounded it there? Now I'm going to do the other side. And now, you can see that I have the bullet shape pretty much formed. Now, this is a little fatter than I'm used to, so I'm just going to take it down a little bit all the way around. And just about there. Just doing a little bit here. And now, what I have is a very nice bullet shape, symmetric on all sides. This bullet shape will allow it to fly through the air very aerodynamically, so you'll still get a lot of distance when you cast it. Now, the one thing I see is this little collar, if you will, of stubs from the butt ends of this. And I'm just going to take them off right now. I still have the longer extensions there, so that's not a problem. 
and they really don't exist up top. So there's my head all trimmed out. So once again, I apologize for missing the mark on the last set, on the last set of interview or the last uh, segment. And I'll pick up with the next segment, which will be the original fly. But I wanted you to get a good look at how you trim that head. Remember, it's vertical, or I should say dorsal, belly, the two sides. And in each case, you're coming in at an angle. You always start from the head and work your way back. If you go the other way, it's going to get ugly in a hurry. And um, then I just take and I work the edges or the lines that are formed in the corners. And I just round everything off. And, you know, it's really not very difficult to figure it out. And the one last thing is, one last little piece of advice. Working with this is kind of like working with spackle. You got to know when enough's enough. Don't go too far. Otherwise, you wreck all your good work. That you can get the fish to key in on. Nice head to push water. And when it gets a little bit wet, this collar comes right in here. Hides that tie-in point. Again, it's all about illusions with fly tying. Control your torque. Work this up as best you can. You're going to get some great flies out of it.